Oh, Back that's to you, fine. Mitch. If there's any questions, happy to answer. Yeah, oh, thank you. That was uh, brilliant and uh, definitely held everyone on because there was lots of great information about uh, technical stuff around dampers and, and the like, but also a, a very, very incredible career and lots of stories. So thank you. So uh, look, I'm going to open it up. I know Hayden's got a question. I'm sure there's plenty of questions out there. Uh, let's see how we go. G'day, Hayden. Thanks, Rick. That was, that was really good, mate. Appreciate it. Uh, you did my shocks earlier this year, actually. John Reese dropped them off to you for me. Oh, right. Yeah, I remember now. There were two of you, aren't there? Hayden and... And Mark, yeah. That's right, yep. Uh, appreciate that. I mean, I haven't had a chance to run them yet, unfortunately. Oh. Thanks, Dan Andrews, but... <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, so just what you're talking about with the magnetic dampers... I've got a mate with a Holden and another mate with a Porsche who have both bought the aftermarket computers for the magnetic dampers. Yep. Can you tune those for them? No, look, it's an area that uh, I quite often they actually lock uh, the computer so that you can't get in to do any of the programming. No, so uh, that these guys have got aftermarket computers where they can fully customise the software themselves. Ah, okay, okay. But... I guess it'd be like me trying to, like, they can jump in and change everything. Yep. They just don't necessarily know what they're doing. They're just Joe Blow from the street. Yeah, look, I understand where you're coming from. It, there's a guy called uh, Dinan, oh, I can't remember his last name, up in Sydney, and um, that's his area of expertise. He, he's actually developed a an overseas shock, I can't remember the brand name now, that is computer controlled. If you watch Time Attack, the Porsche that did the... Um, yeah, the 968. Yep, the 968. So he did the dampers on that and dialed them in on the computer. It so would I, probably... I think this is the same computer, but that... Because they also can buy aftermarket shocks that have a bit more range yep. that you control with the same program. It's quite interesting. I, I always thought it was a bit of mumbo-jumbo, but it's... Once you actually dial into the... And see how they're adjusting every... Yeah. Uh, by G-Force and yep. all these other rules. It's actually, they're, they're so adjustable, it's crazy. Yeah, look, I must admit, I, I'm, I'm old school and uh, and it's an area that sort of started to happen just as I was finishing a Coney. And because most of the race cars that I work with don't have that facility, I mean, probably the only car that I've spent a bit of time with with electronic stuff is uh, current Porsche spec, where we can actually revalve the piston but we still rely on the Porsche program to look at the inputs from the data pots and, and work out whether it's bumpy, smooth, uh, you know, how much the front's diving under brakes, all that sort of stuff. So we've, we've changed the basic damping characteristic, but we still let the computer have its input because with the Porsche, the issue is that it also does sway bars and you've even got a wet button where it'll change brake bias and all sorts of things like that. But Danan, he would certainly be the guy that would be more au fait with, you know, having a look at the computer that they've got and, and being able to redo the program. It's the sort of thing yeah. that I'd probably spend, you know, a week just trying to understand. Which yeah, the program is actually coming. quite easy. So could you revalve their shocks? A lot of electric shocks are tunable, um, but a lot of them aren't. Um, yeah. It all boils down to, oh, I haven't got one here in front of me. I've got an electric set in the uh, workshop that's, from a brand new uh, 992 Turbo S, and where the wires come out of the top, uh, they go down through the shaft to the piston, and with some electric dampers, essentially they make it so that you can't get the piston off the end because you can't essentially pull the wires through the shaft, yep. and um, and so really they're almost impossible to uh, to tune. It, yeah, it, no, that, it, that was I guess that was the main thing. They they the problem with these ones apparently is they just don't have the range that you need for track use. So yeah, it's, a, it's an eight thousand dollar exercise to buy the aftermarket ones. Yep. Yeah. I, I thought if you could revalve them, maybe maybe it would be ideal for them. But yeah, look, I I I, I understand everything that you're talking about and where, where you're coming from. It's just not my area. I mean, it's one no, of the, no, that's I, right. I've just quite often used the term "fish where the fish are," and, uh, <laughs> and I'm still old school. Give me a set of Penske's, Olins, Coney's, Bilstein's, you know, all those good old brand names, and uh, I've got. Ten thousand dollars worth of Penske pistons out there that I can tune shocks with and make them do some pretty amazing things. But when it comes to the electronics, I mean, I've got data there that uh, you know we were going to bring up, um, and I, in my time as an engineer, I understood, you know, looking at 
G-force data, brake traces, throttle traces, all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, yeah, the area that you're talking about, I'd spend too much time trying to learn it and understand. Whereas Danan, he'd probably, um, you know, you'd end up spending less money with him and, and it's an area that he knows really well. Yeah, no, awesome, mate. Anyway, hey, appreciate that. And thanks, and, and thanks for um, your contact, Alan, as well. He's been a ripper. Yeah, great guy, very knowledgeable. And he, I can remember him back in the old days working on that uh, Nations Cup Lotus, uh, typical unsung mechanic, but he's got a very broad knowledge. Yeah, he's really good. Good, great quality stuff and a really nice guy. Sure. Thanks, Hayden. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, look, I'll just, uh, there's a couple in the chat here that I'll ask you, Rick. Yep. Uh, Les Bone, who has a clubman, uh, is asking you to discuss droop in regards to front dampers. On yeah, a good, 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 good question. Um, essentially, most of the cars that uh, people will race out here will be either front engine, rear wheel drive. They may be front wheel drive. I've just done a lot of work on the uh, TCR cars, the, the Hondas and what have you that are, you know, been waiting to race like Aiden. Um, but droop is a really good tuning tool. Um, a guy called Harry Galloway in the 70s made what's called a Galloway link where he had a tube with lots of little holes and essentially set the car up with a lot of droop travel, let the driver go and do half a dozen laps and then he'd jack the suspension up, put a little pin through the hole and limit the droop by 10 mil. Another couple of laps and just kept going less and less droop until the driver went, whoa, I can feel that. And essentially what droop travel in the front does, we talk about keeping weight over the front of the car when you brake, change down, as soon as you release the brake, the front wants to come up. When you get on the accelerator pedal, it wants to come up even more. And all the time the front's coming up, it's transferring weight to the rear of the car. So essentially by minimizing the droop on the front, you keep weight over the front. It gets to the point where it can't go any further to do anything more, it'll have to lift the wheels off the ground. So minimizing droop is a really effective tool for helping the front turn. If you go too far, you'll actually not allow any weight to transfer to the rear and you can make the rear too nervous and tailing because you're not allowing weight to transfer to that end when you need it for getting on the gas. I had one car, Matt Cherry, with his improved production Commodore and um, his mechanic actually mucked up the numbers and I put the droop inside, they bolted it all, went straight to Bathurst. Matt rings me at the end of practice one and says, so never had the car turn like this in my life. Front engine, rear wheel drive, normally they're a lead tipped arrow. Matt's gone unbelievable. I just think about turning and it turns. He said, it's fantastic. He said, but gee, it's a little taily. And he said, and it pogos when it's coming out of the corner. Gets this pogo effect up. And I said, go and get your mechanic to jack the car up and tell me how much the wheels drop down. Comes back. They don't drop at all. I said, okay, nil droop. So what's happened is um, not transferring weight to the rear. And when the pogoing is the car trying to pick the front wheels up off the ground like a drag car. I said, uh, you're just going to have to live with it for the weekend. And after the weekend, we'll take some of that out and give you some droop travel back. Very effective tool, um, especially on front wheel drives. But it does take a little bit. I mean, I've seen guys in TCM just basically get a bit of chain. They put two bolts in and they just hang the chain on a different hook and limit the droop that way until they get it where they want it to be. So you could try something like that. Good question. Next. Uh, I'll keep going just in the interest of time. David Mottram's um, talking about friction dampers. Uh, can you tune those by cranking the centre bolt a bit tighter? Gee, is that the time? Thanks very much, guys. I'll t <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, David. Oh, look, um, it's funny. When I first started at Coney, you know, and, the, and old Sebastian, who you know, was the original guy that came out from Holland, and he said, oh, you must understand about friction dampers. And I said, what is a friction damper? It's only people as old as David Butcher that would know. Um, yeah, look, essentially, if, Dave, if you can understand whatever it is that creates the pressure, and if that is just a centre bolt, then certainly you can create uh, more damping force. The problem with friction dampers is that whatever you create is going to happen in both bump and rebound. So... Uh, Sometimes it's ideal just to have that additional damping in rebound because it helps stop the car roll around, but it doesn't make it harsh and reactive over bumps. But certainly, look, it's the sort of thing that I would suggest, give it a turn, go and drive it, see what it feels like. And if it's a bad move, put it back. So I think it might've been a rhetorical question. 
<laughs> just, okay. just, I, I think I did ask a couple of guys to ask questions to make me look good. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, what else? Uh, Lee is asking about the trade-off between front negative camber and braking effect. It's a good question. Yeah, another too. really good question. This is great. I'm, I'm impressed that you guys are uh, on the money so well with, with a lot of this stuff. And, and a typical case of that is Formula Ford. Uh, front camber, you know, if they want better mid-corner lateral grip, so in other words, going around the corner, you want to produce more grip, you need to put more neg on. But then when you're braking, you don't have as much tyre on the ground. And it's one of those things that um, sometimes driver feedback, sometimes looking at how the tyres are wearing or going on pyro rings can help. And it's the same on the rear. You know, if the car in the middle of, say, high-speed corners that fell apart on like turn one, coming onto the front straight, hay shed, Lukey. If you're struggling for rear grip, um, putting more neg on the rear can help there, but sometimes you go too far and you lose drive because, again, you know, the car's squatting down and you don't have all the time on the ground. Um, it's one of those things that um, if you can spend time testing um, and you've got the ability to, you know, chuck on half a degree, go and drive it, take the degree, half a degree out. If you can do that in and out a couple of times, that's sometimes, you know, about the only way you're really going to be able to tell because, you know, pyros can be misleading. Um, you know, I've often done uh, a pyro reading and it's hot in the centre at the rear and, and pyro readings are temperatures of the tyre, outside, middle, inside. And if it's hot in the centre, you'd instantly think, oh, the tyre's overinflated. But quite often... Uh, the car's getting a bit of wheel spin and that's why the tyre balloons and has that that uh, that crowning temperature in the middle. Um, most uh, GT cars, they tend to run higher pressure in the front than the rear because if the tyre starts off with that bell of overinflation, when you brake, all the weight comes down on the sidewalls and the tyre flattens out on the track and you've got a lot of grip. And on the rear, you actually want it the other way. You want it slightly underinflated that sort of curve this way so that as you try and get on the gas, the tyre wants to grow a little bit like a drag car and you actually end up with more tyre on the grip. And um, so that's just a pressure thing. Camber, we're in the same sort of boat, you know, it, it's it's a, yeah, it's, it's going to. Can I just clarify that one then, Rick? You're saying the, the reverse to what I thought. You're saying um, more pressure in the front to start off with than the rear. It depends on the car. If you've got a mid-engine or a rear engine, sometimes with all that additional weight at the back, you will need more pressure at the rear. But um, it's an interesting fact. I, I would, nearly all cars on the racetrack respond to slightly more pressure on the front than the rear so that you've got better grip under braking and, uh, and, and you're using the tyre more efficiently at the back for drive. So with a Lotus, I would always probably start off with the tyres even, front and rear, and then look at what happens to the pressures. Um, you know, if uh, if you were to start off at, say, 28 cold, go out onto the track, do half a dozen laps, come into the pits and have someone jump on the pressure straight away, if the fronts have come up, you know, three pound, and the rears have come up five pound, then the rears are doing a lot more work. And, uh, yeah, you're going to want to drop those pressures down to, uh, to get that, uh, that, that build-up of temperature back to where it needs to be. So. Uh, that, that's an interesting one because, you know, the rear of the V6-Exige worked pretty hard. And yep. I noticed Phil's got a question here about the wear, the V6-Exige wearing the centre out of the rear tyres when used on the track, which, yeah, you might want to comment on that one. Yeah, sure. Look, as I said, um, camber <coughs> and pressure... We, we talk about shocks producing grip, springs and sway bars producing balance. In other words, if understeer, oversteer is what you're trying to attend to, springs and bars are a really good thing. But pressure uh, in the tyre, I mean, making the tyre work efficiently is the key. Um, you know, when Tony Volander came out for the 12 hour, on the dash of the Ferrari, he used to be able to bring up tyre pressures and he would always be on the radio to me saying, we are half a bar to a march in front tyres. And, you know, I was going all over the world trying to get the tyres to exactly... And he'd driven these cars all over the world, so he knew exactly where he wanted 
that Pirelli race tyre to be. Um, but he knew that that particular tyre worked best at this particular pressure. Um, Christopher, Chris Mees in the Audi, he would tune the last part of his handling with front tyre pressure. If he wanted a little bit more response at the front, he'd just inflate the front tyres a little to just sharpen up the response on the wheel. And if the car was a little bit too pointy and he was worried a little bit about the rear, he'd take, you know, just half a pound out of the fronts to make the sidewall a bit softer to dowie up the front so it helped keep the car in balance. Tire pressures, easiest way is really to look at something like temperature. And as soon as you've got, uh, I mean, all tires actually want a little bit more temperature on the inside. You might have say 110 degrees on the inside of the, of the surface of the tire, uh, 100 or 95 in the middle and 85 on the outside. That's actually where you want to aim for. You don't want them to be dead even. But if you're wearing the center of your tires, you're probably going to find it's 90, 110, 90. And that's normally over inflation or, you know, just ballooning and driving and, and wheel spinning. But I, if, if the car's not, you know, really sliding a lot and you're not, you know, putting your foot down and you can hear it going and, and, and spinning up the tires, it's more likely going to be over inflation. Okay. Uh, Rowan, do you want to ask that question? Um that you've got here. Rowan's got one for you. Yeah, hi Rick. Um, many years ago you told me um, when adjusting springs to try it in about 50% rate change steps because that's about as, as small a step as most drivers can feel. Um, is that still your advice? Look, I'm not sure I would have said 50%, maybe 50 pound perhaps, but, but it realistically we talk about cars getting in a window and, um, you know, that, that Ferrari, um, the Audi, the McLarens that we had over in Asia, I could do two clicks of damper and the driver would feel it. You know, we'd do two turns of ride height and the driver would feel it and be able to tell us what that change did. Uh, in a car like that, 50 pound would almost be too much of a change. You might be looking for 25 pound. Um, it really boils down to how well you know the car and, and what the spring numbers are. Um, I mentioned earlier that you can do a calculation to come up with, you know, what the theory says on the spring rate for the car. It comes from understanding the load that's on one side. So let's say you've got a, a spring, a 200 pound spring, you stick the car on its wheels and it compresses two inches. So 200 pound by two, that's a 400 pound load. To work out the spring rate as a starting point, that load, you add half the load from the other side because when the car breaks and turns, that's the sort of load that's going to be there. Load plus half. So 400 plus 200, that'd be a 600 pound working load in the middle of the corner. You then have to look at the amount of travel you've got in bump and you have to have enough spring rate to stop that travel from being used. So if you've got two inches of travel, you're 600 pound divided by two, 300 pound would be the spring rate as a starting point. That's the calculation. You're in that sort of zone the car would probably respond to very small spring changes. Another way to tell would be to do a sway bar change. Uh, often I've said to people, just take the link off one side of the sway bar at the back. So that essentially you're taking the sway bar out of the equation and go and drive it for a couple of laps, see what it does. And if you take the link off and go, whoa, I can't drive it. It's completely, you know, turned into a, a piece of poop. Um, then you know that the car is in a really good window and you'd be back to a, a 50 pound spring rate change or a 25 pound rate change. Um, Jason White, I do his cars, the Vipers down in Target has. And at one point he said, mate, we haven't got time for spring change. I need more front turn, it's wet. And I said, let's take a link off the front part. Very unusual, we did and, and he loved it. Um, as soon as it dried up and he went back to really high speed stuff, the bar went back on. But, but at the end of the day, if that's sort of a bit of an idea, um, normally I'd say sort of 50 pound maybe it, it, it depends on motion ratio Rowan too a bit like some cars have a really big motion ratio that means that the wheel moves a lot more than the shock pardon me so essentially if you've got a um, a 2 to 1 motion ratio uh, and you've got a 200 pound spring the wheel rate is only 50 pound so if you did a 50 pound spring change you're only going to change it by 15 pound very few drivers can feel 15. So a few things that come into play there, but I'd, I'd normally say probably 50 pound 
uh, in a Lotus would be 50 to 100 pounds would be a, a reasonable. Yeah, well, 50 pounds on the back of my land is about 40%. So Perfect. We've done well. Yeah. Okay, I've got a couple of questions, but I'm sure there's others that have plenty of questions. Uh, speak up or... Um, Forever hold your peace. Yeah. Anyone got a question there? All right, well, I will ask my final question. Well, actually, I had a couple of questions, but you probably have partly answered my question because right, you talked a bit about the differences circuit racing, tarmac rallying, um, uh, you know, dirt rallying and different setups would apply for each. So, you know, is it, is it possible in, and, and I guess it's a, also a sort of maybe similar question when it comes to different conditions in each of those categories as well. Um, you know, the, the Lotus is pretty good at being able to do a lot of things, but what do you need to have to adjust to be able to have the one car to, to, to deal with all of those, maybe not dirt rallying, but between tarmac and... Yep, sure. Good, good, good question. And, and I get asked that question a lot. I, to give you an example, I've got a 996 Porsche suspension out there at the moment um, that has adjustable dampers. And essentially, the guy had it as a circuit car and he wants to run a tar tarmac event. And um, I looked at the range of the adjuster from full hard to full soft on this particular brand was quite good. So when you went to soft, it was, you know, a big chunk of damping that dropped right out of it. And secondly, um, the spring rate was quite high for the circuit work. And I said, honestly, I think you'll be okay if we just, you know, drop, say, you know, a third of that spring rate out of the car. Um, now, at the end of the day, guys like Jason White, who win Target Tasmania and High Country and all those sort of events, you know, their car is an absolute purpose-built tarmac car. You know, the springs are very specific to be able to cope with wet, dry. Um, you know, we use bump rubbers. There's a lot of work in getting those to come into play at the right time. And, and it's all about making the car forgiving. And one of the best things about Lotuses is how forgiving they are. You know, they're a very easy car to drive on the limit. And, they, and if you have a Lotus that isn't forgiving and wants to bite you, then that's the thing you want to fix. Once you get the car to being, you know, an example is if you know if you overcook it and it just starts to have a bit of a slide and you can just ease off the throttle and catch it bring it back under control and continue that's an easy car you're going to drive that car at you know 10 tenths or 9.9 tenths if as soon as it started to, to slide it snapped and let go you'll only ever drive that car at eight tenths because you know it's going to bite you and bring you undone and it'll be a big consequences so making it forgiving is the biggest key some cars, um, if they've got adjustable shocks, adjustable sway bars, you might get a spring that would do tarmac and, and club circuit. Um, there's always going to be time in either of those two events if you really wanted to dial it in to be specific for that type of event, though. And this guy is going to do just that. He's going to have a set of springs for tarmac and a set of springs for uh, circuit, and his dampers will cope with that change and his sway bars. And he'll be raising the car a little for ride eye. Uh, he doesn't have enough bump travel uh, for uh, tarmac work. One, one little e example on tyres, um, Ray Hislop, in improved production, the Yokohama A050 was the control tyre. And uh, the big cars, the Commodores and Falcons, were having a lot of failures. So they were about to pull that tyre as the control tyre. And we went to Phillip Island uh, with Ray and Paul as drivers, me doing the engineering, a couple of mechanics, and the idea was to spend a day to try and see if we could make the tyres loop. So at the start of the day, three laps around the lap record pace, and we blew the right front tyre. Um, what happens when these tyres blow, especially the R-spec tyres, they're so sticky, when you go out of the pits, the compound or the surface sticks to the track very quickly, but the carcass is still cold, so all the cording and the construction doesn't have any suppleness, doesn't want to move, but the surface wants to stick to the track, and you get the surface of the tyre wiping itself across the carcass and it produces a gas bubble. The gas bubble becomes a blister, the blister becomes a chunk, and that's the start of the tyre delamination and the tyre failure. So one of the things that tyre people will always tell you is to pump the tyres up. And as soon as you pump the tyres up to, uh, you know, 36 pound or 40 PSI, 
all of a sudden the whole thing's very rigid and that doesn't become an issue, but you lose a lot of speed on the track. So we, we pumped the tyres up to, I think, 36. Instantly, Ray lost balance, lost speed, and then we tried to work the springs and bars and dampers back to trying to find that speed we lost to run at that tyre pressure, which we luckily achieved, and uh, and it actually saved the Yokohama. It's still the control tyre for, uh, for that category. Uh, the other 50% of making the tyre live quite often does come from the driver though. And that means anything you can do to bring that tyre on uh, in a uniform fashion before you go absolutely flat out out the gate is worth its weight in gold. So I'm not sure if anybody here has tyre failures, but if you do, that's how it all starts. That compound being sticky, running across the uh, carcass uh, and uh, creating this gas bubble. So um, yeah, a lot of work. I mean, you look at F1, I have drivers that quite often say, oh, you know, I've read in books that the only way to really bring tyres on is accelerate and brake. Well, yep, you'll tend to get a lot of heat into the tyre from accelerating and braking, but you will also get heat into the tyre from working the steering wheel. Find me an F1 driver that doesn't do this. So, you know, I tend to always tell my drivers to work the wheel both ways. So, yeah, to answer your question, Vic, it, it's certainly possible to have a car that can sort of do both jobs, but you could make them a little better if you specifically dial them into one or the other. So when you say dial it in, I mean, what um, would you would you need at least two ways then to be able to get enough? Yeah, those nitron dial? shocks. I must admit, I'm pretty impressed. Nitron, it's a, it's a the UK company. They're a copy of a Penske. Once you open them up and look inside, I've actually often thought about putting a Penske Penske piston inside. Um, and it's interesting, Chris O'Connor, wherever you are, you and I had this conversation and decided to head down the path of, uh, I'm not sure, should I tell people that you've got Penske's or they already know? Anyway, I uh, so basically, <laughs> I, I, I really like the Nitron. I think it's a great shock. Um, I have a, a difference of opinion with them about length on the dampers. The, the set that we made for Paul's car, I gave them a build sheet with specific lengths and the valving that, uh, that they were going to build for us. And uh, they rang me and said, oh, you've got your lengths wrong. And I go, yeah, no, just build them. And I don't know if anybody saw Steve, was it Steve Glennie last year in the Lotus at, um, at Tar Target Tasmania when he crashed? So have a look at his car coming over the bridge. That was the lengths that Nitron built. And um, anyway, Paul's oh. car was just a dream. But anyway, end of the day, that Nitron, especially the three-way Nitron, it's probably got enough range to do tarmac work or circuit work and cope. Um, you might find, you know, you'd, you'd have to, uh, I don't know if you've got adjustable sway bars, that would certainly help. Um, you might even find, I mean, a set of springs is not a lot of money. You know, probably $500 would buy you a full set of springs and a set of springs for circuit, set of springs for tarmac. That, that would certainly be enough to be very competitive. Thanks for that. Um, uh, Josh is saying he's getting Penske's now. That's interesting. Uh, Lee's asking about your, because we, there's been a bit of talk about tyres. And I actually, uh, talking to the tyre guy the other day, he said the 50s are, I don't know, maybe it was the UK. Someone told me the 50s, uh, maybe it's just Europe. The 50s are no longer being sold. There's a replacement. And, uh, but anyway, I think the question really from Lee is what's your favorite aspect? Yeah, look, I, I must admit, um, uh, I, I probably don't spend a lot of time at that level anymore. Um, I mean, you know, with Jason White, that's a guy that flies me down for testing. We look at all the different tire brands, uh, for the Viper, they were limited at one point. Um, I think Michelin and, uh, I can't remember what the other brand was that, that they were the only two tires made in the size for that particular car. And, and lately there's now a number of different brands, Dunlop, Bridgestone, Michelin, uh, something else. And it's interesting when you back to back test these different tires, they've all got good points and bad points. You know, some of them are just a really good overall tire for wet, dry. Um, some of them are great in the wet, but they squirm too much in the dry. Um, to answer the question, favorite tire. Ah, oh, look, it's probably the tyre that you can get fairly easily. Uh, talk to the guys about, you know, what, what sizes you're going to get. Quite often, 
I shouldn't mention names, but you know, Russell Stuckey, you're not here, are you? Um, I can, when I was racing, <laughs> I can so clearly good. remember Russell going, mate, I've got the perfect tyre for your car. No, and it was the one that he had the most of out the back. You know, years later, you find out that it's this rotten old thing that, you know, as hard as nails. Actually, Darren Hossack, when he was racing the Saab Sports sedan, I can remember trying to um, work that car and testing. And, and in the end, Darren said, look, everything we're doing, I still have this issue with the back of the car. I just really struggle for grip. And we were running a standard sort of, you know, 30 PSI, which is what nearly every, you know, race slick is recommended as a benchmark tyre pressure, hot. And I said, mate, I'm going to take some pressure out of the tyres. I dropped them to 28. And he said, oh, I think that feels better. 26. He said, whatever you're doing, he said, we're making huge. We got down to 22. And the thing was just becoming a jet. And uh, I did some homework after the test day. And I still had some friends back in Europe. And I said, just tell me what this tyre is used for. Turns out it was designed for Le Mans, for the Mulsanne, you know, the big, when it was straight, sitting on, you know, 380 to 400 k's an hour, this massively stiff, strong sidewall construction to cope with the aero loads at that speed. It was never going to work in this, you know, sports sedan out here on all the stop go tracks. And 22 pound was the only pressure we found that, that made the thing work. It was an absolute jet. So, you know, finding the brand of tyre that, um, I mean, tyre guys that can tell you the, the truth about the tyre is a bit of a rare commodity too. You know, the number of times I've had, <laughs> you know, I, I think we're running uh, those Evos in production and the Hankook was the control tyre. And we knew we were going to have issues in this uh, three-hour race. And, you know, I'd taken the camber out of it. We'd raised the pressures. And at the end of qualifying, we're limited to at, you know, 12 tyres. And I looked at the four tyres on the car and said the two right-hand side tyres, took them down to the Hankook and said, mate, I've got issues here. Like, this thing's not going to live. And he goes, yeah and uh i said i've taken camber out i've raised the pressure he goes yeah he said uh, unfortunately he said you know i'm being truthful here but our tires just can't keep up with how quick these cars are on these sorts of racetracks anymore he's probably the only bloke that's been completely honest with me normally no you're not running enough pressure mate i had one guy i remember at bathurst and um we they you could see the splice line where the tires join uh, on some of the tyres. And, you know, this is after they'd fitted them up to our ribs. So I went down to the tyre guy and said, um, this splice line, mate, like it's nearly a mil. And he goes, yeah, it'll be fine. I go, really? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I go, so you're saying we could qualify on that tyre on the hardest working corner of the right rear and have no issues? He goes, oh, well, I probably wouldn't qualify on it. I go, well, it's not all right then. And he goes, oh, well, um, um, you know, but you've already got your tyre allocation. So, and nothing I could do would get him to sign that tyre off and give us another tyre. And Alan Heafy was the team manager back then. I said, Alan, you need to go and talk to this bloke. Alan comes back in 15 minutes with the new tyre fitted. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, finding a tyre guy that'll tell you the truth. It's a really difficult question to answer, Vic. Um, I, look, you know, I must admit that the guys down at Yokohama are very good at what they do, traction tyres. I do rate Shano um, and, um, and Andrew down there. So, yeah, maybe Yokohama, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're good blokes. Um, like I say, a call out. Uh, you've been going now strong for almost two hours. So you've Sorry. done. No, no, don't apologize. It's, uh, it's been really, really valuable and entertaining. Lots of great stories. So thank you. But one last call out to everyone online as to whether there's any more questions before we finish up. Oh. Here we go. Andrew's asked one. How important is it to match valving to spring rate? So if you drop spring rate with the same valving, how to adjust bump and rebound? Yeah, great question. Um, look, realistically, every book will tell you that, you know, the valving is always about the spring rate and the motion ratio. Um, having said that, if you've got a really good brand of damper, like if you've got a, a name like a Penske, Ollens, uh, I'd put Nitron in there. Coney, Bilstein, they're very efficient and they'll cope with pretty big spring rate changes. Um, you know, if you were to go from a 250 pound spring to a, you know, a 700 pound spring, yeah, you probably wouldn't find any damper that would cope with that um, and you'd need to revalve it. But pardon me, it's quite interesting. The more efficient the damper is internally, uh, the better it'll cope with spring rate changes. And in actual fact, a lot of the books used to say, if you want to go up in spring rate at the rear by, say, 100 pound, 
you'd have to change the rebound and change the bump. We don't do that in race cars anymore. Essentially, you know, when the damping's about right for grip for this particular circuit and what this driver likes, uh, quite often we'll do a spring change and no other changes and just let him go and taste the spring. And, and he'll either come back and go, I think we're heading in the right direction. Let's now tune around this spring. And then you might do a damper change or a bar change or something like that. Um, so, yeah, the old school way of make a spring change, immediately make a damper change has probably gone out the door a bit. It's more about uh, how big is the spring change and how good is your damper. Good Excellent. Uh, Hayden here's asking uh, about the brand of shocks you like on the 996 and the kilowatts as well. I think that was the question. Yeah, look, uh, I was lucky to do um, Porsche Cup or Cup Car. Um, at the time, I think I started off filling in uh, and then I ended up staying on. It was Greg Murphy Racing when we ran Alex Davison and Fabian Coulthard, and we were kind of the benchmark team. We were winning the championships. And the 996 in those days had a sack stamper that had um, bump and rebound on a canister. Um, and that was a pretty good shock. The sack stamper that they've been using in V8 supercars is another very good shock. Uh, the sack stamper they use in the current cup car is a piece of poop. Honestly, it's 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 the cheapest shot they bend. Um, you know, I've seen three or four brand new dampers run them on the dyno, and they're all different. And and essentially, they're kind of made that way on purpose. They just they punch them out. It's like a, a, the cheap end of sacks. So knowing just the brand can be a bit misleading. Um, for nine nine six, Intrax uh, and Motion Control Systems MCS, gee, they're good brands for Porsche. They you know they they do a lot of homework. Um, I suppose with all the different brands, you know, I, I worked at Coney for 12 years, went to the factory, did training. I came out of there thinking that Coney was the best shock in the world. Then you work with Ollens, Penske, Bilstein, you know, all these other brands. They've all got their good points and bad points. If I had to say, is there one shock that always stands out to me? It's probably Ollens. You know, there is something about, you know, I reckon one Allen key and a screwdriver, and I can probably have every Ollens apart on the bench in 15 minutes. Um, you know, you look at their piston design, the way they understand porting and fluid dynamics. Whew. I remember Marco, I used to talk to him at Coney about, you know, if we needed to port some oil and we needed, say, two mil of flow, do I do that with 4.5 holes or 3.7 holes? And he would go into this big chart and look at fluid dynamics, come back and say, yeah, for this particular situation. And he'd tell me the, the, the right number of holes in the right diameter. How do you work that out? I mean, you know, it's, it's I, uh, Hayden, when he was asking before about computers and, you know, running the programs and all that sort of stuff. I mean, there's, I, I don't think I'm the smartest bloke in this business. I, I've been lucky to have a really broad range. I've worked with drag cars, dirt cars, circuit, you know, hill climbs, everything. I've had a bit of racing experience. I'm, I'm a, probably a pretty good all-rounder, but um, there are certainly guys smarter than me, but yeah, look, for a 996, Intrax, Olins, um, and MCS, they're, they're very good brands for Porsche. Thanks. No problem. Oh, sorry, Anything I've else? got myself on mute, but uh, if there's no other questions, I, I think you're up now for a well-deserved rest, Rick. Uh, that's, that was really excellent, very enjoyable. Very informative. So, um, yeah, thank you hey, Vic, so I'm, much. I'm, I'm happy if um, if anybody wants to have a chat. I, I'm semi-retired. I work from home. I've got a great little workshop. I've got a shock dyno. I'm still an enthusiast. And, and you know, Chris O'Connor and Rowan will tell you about the days that I was in the Bowl Car Club. I, you know, used to race a Mark 7 and then a Mark 4. I built a Nagari convertible. I, you know, I... I I love that scene. And of course, Bowl Car Club Lotus, you know, we would always do stuff together, Mark Sports. It was my bread and butter. So um, if anybody ever wants to ring me and just have a chat, please feel free. I mean, if, if I'm really busy, I might say, look, can I call you back or can you give me a ring, you know, in two days? Um, but luckily at the moment, um, thanks to um, uh, COVID. Dated Dan. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, not, not the most popular bloke in the country at the moment. Um, I've probably got a bit of time on my hands. So yeah. I'm happy, Vic. Just pass the number on. Um, 
more than happy to talk. And thank you for having me, guys. I, I, I really enjoy this sort of stuff. And uh, and I can't believe that we've been here this long and you're still awake. Uh, are you awake, David Monkin? Oh, yeah, no, you're awake. <laughs> Okay, then. Thanks. Thanks again. And thanks to everyone for joining in. We've managed to keep really good participation. Very grateful for your attendance. And yes, uh, see you again, probably next month. We will have another. Um, in fact, we've got 